fellow watch enthusiasts, thank you for tuning in. My name is Nicholas Hecko and I'm third generation master watchmaker. Hello, I'm Andrew Barriero, I'm a third year apprentice and a workshop manager. And my name is Josh Hacker, and I'm a fourth generation watchmaker and technical director at NHW. And also a machinist. And also a machinist. So why are we here tonight? Uh, the plan is simple. We would like to recommend nine YouTube videos for your attention. And I'll be recommending three videos and Andrew and Josh as well. But the question is, Andrew, why are we recommending videos? Um, my initial um, re reaction to that question is we're recommending these videos to help our viewers, anyone who's watching this video, to gain an appreciation and understanding of this industry and just how difficult it is to be successful and to complete um, a sort of design and manufacture uh, that we are trying to do. Not only in Australia. Not only in Australia. So this is uh, across the board. This is in Switzerland. This is in Germany. This is in France, Japan, Japan um, Italy as well. Uh, anywhere where watches are being made or designed or hand finished. Um, it's tough. Yeah, it is. It's very difficult. And there are people who are much better than us and with very much more experience who still struggle. They struggle with the exact same things that we do. Um, and it's, it's humbling to, to watch these videos from our point of view. So we want you to watch this. And we believe that if you spend time watching these particular videos that we'd like to recommend for your viewing is that your appreciation of watchmaking and of your own watch will mm. surely uh, increase. But before we go into videos, uh, just very briefly, what are you doing, Andrew, right now as we speak? At the moment, I'm working on a little project, which uh, some of our viewers, I think, will be able to recognize purely from the, just the shape of this wheel, uh, what I'm working on. Well, uh, can tell viewers yeah, we'll, what are you working on exactly. We'll maybe leave that for another day, but um, here's just a small little pinion, a little um, arbor, just sort of prototype that we're making. Um, that I would assume we'll make in a, a sort of announcement in another video. At another video. Date. What about you, Josh? I'm, well, in the past maybe year and a half, we've been plotting away at a long-term project, which is to make our in-house gears and our in-house gear train. And we've started manufacturing some gears on our Affleter AF90 gear hobbing machine. But the blank preparation of each gear is quite, quite an important facet of it and I'm making this uh, stamping press and so I, I had a friend of mine from the US uh, make the design of the press and I've been slowly plotting away at the, at the construction of the press in the past like six months or so. So long story short we have raw material come in and a blank uh, gear come out so it's just a disc really but it's a very precise disc. And uh, are you Close to completion of the project, or oh, I, I hope so. I, I don't know. It's one of those things where you you kind of keep testing, and until you get the right part out, then you'll finish the project. So. Very good. So let's get into recommendations. My first recommendation is a video called Le Roi, a precision watchmaking, and this video is about. It's a documentary. It's a brand documentary. It's a it's a video commissioned by a brand. Uh, but in a style of a documentary, uh, and uh, it's f it's a French. Have I said this already? Uh, about 15 minutes long. But uh, I'm not going to spoil your enjoyment about the uh, uh, what's going on in a video. I just would like to uh, uh, bring your attention to uh, something called Meridian Circle. The Meridian Circle featured in a video is an instrument for timing the passing of stars across the local meridian. And that is a fascinating telescope. And this was actually my first uh, time, my first video where I was uh, uh, able to see how that precision instrument works. Uh, it's the um, locate, it's located at the Besançon uh, Observatory. And the timing is about 1880s uh, amazing, amazing quest for precision. So it's really about astronomy more than horology, uh, where astronomers were the gatekeepers of timekeeping. 
Uh, it's fascinating. I love it. I think you will enjoy it. And if you like those historical documentaries, then mm. Le Roi is the one to watch. Oh, I guess I'll go next. So my first uh, recommendation is the um, Watches TV. So just quickly to preface this, uh, the Watches TV is a YouTube channel. They have hundreds of fantastic videos. I strongly recommend you watch all of them. But uh, the first one that I would suggest is the um, video, which is kind of a documentary, almost an interview uh, of the head designer at Agenhor and the Agenhor chronograph that they designed um, for anyone who wants to purchase it. They don't have their own watch. They're a movement manufacturer for other people. So they make movements for uh, Hermes, MB&F, um, they make Vacheron, uh, sorry, Van Cleef and Arpels Midnight um, Planetarium components and they're part of their poetic complications. So they're very, very, very good uh, manufacturer of movements and very good designers. Now, I, I want to recommend this particular video um, because something stood out and it's, it's something that's important to me in the whole process of the manufacturing of the design. So the, the particular designer um, came up with uh, what he wanted from this movement. He had an issue with how chronographs were spread out in their subdials. He didn't like that, it's not very legible. So he, he set out to make something where all the hands are in the center. Um, watching the video, you'll see really the, the actual process of the design. It's not necessarily talked about too much uh, how he got from A to B in terms of his own development, but how long it, did it was took him eight, eight years. Wow. So from start to finish, from when he said, yep, this is what I want, it was eight years later that he eventually got the chronograph that he, he sort of saw. Um, in his dreams, I guess, as a, mm. as a solution to the problem. Um, and for the last year, they had five people uh, fully dedicated to only working on the development of this movement. Um, so it's just, as a sort of designer or in that field, I uh, pay a lot of respect to those people who can just stick with something for so long and struggle with different components and different materials to try and get a result that's never been achieved before. It's a very, very interesting video. And it goes for how long? Uh, that one goes for about 10 minutes. So 10 it's not too minutes. long. It's literally just him talking about his movement and um, it's very, very informative. Thank you. Well, you will find the links to uh, our recommended videos in the uh, description of this video. So don't worry too much. You can check them, uh, uh, if, uh, check the links later. Josh, your first recommendation? I have um, a whole series of videos on how the watches are made on, in an industrial sort of scope. Mm. And the first one is what I like to call Patek One. And because Patek released two videos that says Patek One and Patek Two. So Patek One is where they're making the Grandmaster Chime. And uh, it's about what, maybe 10 to 15 mm. minutes long. Mm. And it's a step-by-step -step exploration of how a watch, a very complicated watch, but also any watch, is made on an, in an industrial way. Mm -hmm. And it's unapologetic in its representation of how a watch is made. And I think the beautiful thing about it for me, coming from a more technical perspective, is that um, they, don't, they don't put this marketing fluff that a lot of other brands put around the, the manufacturer of the watch. A lot of brands kind of almost trick the the consumer into thinking that every single part is made by hand and you know in their factory in their factory yeah. exactly and carefully sculpted and all the rest when in reality there's a large presence of cnc machines you can see one sitting behind us and they're unapologetic that that's what they use because really it's the best form it's the most accurate uh, uh way of creating a watch um mm. and then they also unapologetically show how they hand finish those parts. So you have the fabrication element, which is kind of the CNC manufacturer and the high tech precise um, part of the process. And then you've got the kind of artistic and very controlled and very, uh, I guess, subjective in, in a way. We always say that it takes two to make a watch. A watchmaker. That's right. And a machinist. And a machinist. And Patek beautifully combines both. Both, yeah. In, in, in one under one roof. Mm -hmm. So years, decades, hundreds of years of skills built yeah. by manual labor, hand polishing to perfection and 
most modern CNC machinery. That's right. So it's that's it's a good representation of what a two hundred year old plus whatever it is company approaches watchmaking. Yeah, very good. Um, my second recommendation is English documentary. Again, it's a short documentary filmed somewhere. It's hard to tell somewhere around early 1980s, and it's called The Watchmaker. Uh, the Watchmaker is a somber video. Mm -hmm. It's not uplifting at all. Mm -hmm. it, it breaks my heart. Uh, it's a video that breaks my heart because uh, the Watchmaker in a video, it's, it's an elderly gentleman He's probably 90s, mm. still in his workshop, small uh, uh, repair shop, and he sums up his life in one sentence, which is, it all came to nothing. And you have to watch it, regardless of whether you're in a watchmaking or you're just a machinist with a workshop, doesn't matter what your product is, but you don't want, I don't mm. want to end up my life saying those words, mm. it all, it all, came for nothing. Uh, why it came to nothing? Because every workshop is, is kind of uh, the two forces that, that try to destroy the workshop. Mm. And first, destructive force is entropy. It's a really lack of order and lack of predictability. And it's a gradual decline into disorder. Mm. And when you watch that video, you can see his shop gradually declining in disorder. And it's an irre irreversible process. You remember how we visited, you probably think of that right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, that machinist in Sydney yeah. a couple of years ago, and, and just give us a, an overview of, of the state of his workshop. Yeah, I guess it reflects that video quite well, because this was an elderly gentleman, kind of past, past retirement, kind of... He couldn't let it go. At the mm. doorstep of death. <laughs> you know? And Reality, his workshop yeah. was, was really uh, in that entropy phase where... The less he was present in the workshop, the more it decayed. And you walked in and you saw these very expensive, very unique, very particular tools just on the ground collecting rust. Machinery. And, uh, machinery, mm. tools, Some parts. Some in, in front of the shed, in front oh, of the yeah. workshop, there rusting was, on a... There's some old burnishing machines, so... Oh, we would love them, eh? Oh, man. Rusted completely, but they were under us like a... a like not even a full tarp in his in his front lawn, mm. um, and you could sort of see the yellow original paint, but it was mostly red rust, and it's just sad. It's, it is sad. It's very sad. Um, the the second destructive force in any workshop is the force that comes within you, and and this is why the watchmaker, English watchmaker, said it all came to nothing because he felt that he has so much to share. Mm. and to pass on his knowledge, but it was too late. Mm. And that, that is one of my fears. This is what, why we do what we do. I don't want, I don't want to reach you know, at that stage of my life when I would say, it's too late, I had the opportunity to train other people and pass my knowledge, a little I have, and, and work, build a team. And, and I, would, I don't want, it's my fear, I don't want that. So, mm. so this is why I put so much effort. Mm. So watch this video. I think it's, it is a somber video, but you will learn a lot from it. It's a short video. Mm. Well, Your much. second video, Andrew? My second video is a long video, like roughly about 25 minutes. And it is um, similar, to, similar to the Patek videos in that you get to see all of what this particular manufacturer does, but it's not so much uh, just the display. It's almost an interview as well. Um, again, this is on Watchers TV. I can't stress enough how good this channel is. You should watch all the videos. But um, it is the Alanga and Zerner factory and the um, interviewer basically gets taken through that factory by their um, head engineer. All the different processes, the different rooms where the finishing is done, where the machining is done and all this sort of thing. And um, that, that video itself goes right through, again, the whole kind of manufacturing process of um, a sort of a company that does make everything themselves or at least most things themselves. And they are very good at it. Um, so it's a very good uh, video for that. More so, the thing that I took from this particular video is that in their engraving stage on the uh, balance cock of their watches, um, they only have about six engravers that actually do the work. 
and they only get given a design brief. They say, we, this particular watch, we want a floral engraving, that's it. Or they might say, I want a sort of like a, like a water kind of wavy engraving, depending on the, uh, the actual model. Once they get that design brief, they get to do whatever they want. So what happens at the end of the day is a particular watch can be traced back to a particular engraver mm -hmm. purely on the handwriting of their of their engraving technique and they know Good they stuff. can see they go oh that was so and so he did this one because he likes doing it you know this way and i i thought that that kind of uh, human element of of watchmaking is very very important it's a similar thing to uh patek have a watch where they've actually used the um one of the designers handwriting probably like stylized version but one of the designers handwriting for the typography of the watch dial I thought that was very, very interesting as well, because you can mm. tell that it's been written by hand. It's not a sort of computer manifested, perfectly, you know, curved arcs and, and such. So I thought that was very interesting. But um, with uh, Lange as well, their uh, Handwerksgunst, I'm saying that right, Handwerksgunst uh, watch dials, their uh, rate of rejection is about nine out of every ten. Um, and these particular watches are very expensive and the, the lead designer in the video makes a point to say he gets stressed out a lot because he gets so many emails from customers, from his own salespeople at the different Lange boutiques saying, hey, we could have sold a hundred of these watches. You need to make more customers saying we want them. When can we get them? And he, all he can say is, sorry, I can't make any more because it just takes this long. That's the process, that's how long it takes, this is how difficult it is, and we don't get many out of it. Because the smallest defect, as they are all done by hand, the smallest defect means you have to reject the whole part. So the, the weak link there is, is really the, the kind of watchmaker, you know, hammering away to, to get that dial effect um, and doing it well enough so that they can actually have some sort of batch. Uh, I think they do it in batches of 20. So it's not very many watches when salespeople from all over the world are saying we could easily sell hundreds of these watches. So I think so that, that we human struggle, element, yeah. With, with our Timascus oh. project, then we can always look back and watch that That's video right. and say, That's it's not too bad. I mean, yeah. Lungus struggles as well. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's, it's humbling. It's, it's, it's nice to know that other people are struggling and, you know, struggling for different reasons, but yeah. So, so this is a, how long this video goes about, for? About 25 minutes and it's the full factory walkthrough, but that particular component of the video I thought was quite interesting. Mm. Thank you. The second video I've got is another factory walkthrough mm. by The Watchers TV, mm. which is <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> right? Um, and it's the walkthrough at Armin Strom. Mm. And uh, this was super interesting to me because it's, it, I wouldn't say polar opposite, but it's very different to the kind of uh, the video that Patek put out, Patek One, right? Mm. Um, and the reason. Uh, obviously in the format, but I'm more talking on the technical stance. This is a really young company. I'd say, it's, mm. I don't actually know, but it was, I think it was like 2007, 2008 when they started. Yeah, it's like 10, 10 to 13 years, somewhere in yeah. that area. I'm not, I'm not truly sure, but an old name. So Armin Strom was a watchmaker from, you know, I mean, he's still alive, but he's mm. an old dude. Um, and it, all this video shows is the modern uh, route to the industrial approach of watchmaking. Mm. And, uh, Have you learned something? Any, any trade secrets oh, from the video? A lot. <laughs> a lot? <laughs> no, there's, it's, 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 it's absolutely invaluable. You know, you see just one little way, maybe the way the factory is laid out, or one little way that one machine sort of... Mm. Or one particular component. One particular, how it's made and all those sort of things. But um, what's fascinating is that they don't abandon the classic like uh, staples of watchmaking in hand finishing either. So they say, yeah, unashamedly, we use the best CNC machines that we can afford, and this is, you know, this is our uh, computer design uh, like office, mm -hmm. and we make all these parts on machines, right? So it's not handmade per se, but then we've got a whole floor dedicated to hand finishing and making these parts look beautiful, um, and. This is, I guess, a very educational sort of video for a lot of watch collectors, it, at least it should be, because these watches are kind of like the, up there in the top. Mm. They're, not, they're not throwaway Seikos, and they're not like kind of in maybe the holy trinity of Swiss watchmaking, but mm. they're pushing the limits of what you can do. 
And I don't want a watch collector to think that the Holy Trinity of watchmaking is the only thing to collect exactly and get excited about. Exactly, there's a lot of different brands that are doing this. I think the more I watch videos, I discover more brands which are under the radar. Yeah, and they work as hard. Oh yeah, as everyone else. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unfairly, they don't get recognition. Uh, This is actually uh, probably the best introduction to my third and last introduction or recommendation uh, a video about Parmigiani mm-hmm. watch factory uh, it's called the beauty uh, the Parmigiani art of watchmaking this is a longish documentary how long 50 uh, something minutes yeah. long mm. it's a kind of uh, watchmakers video that you want to watch on Sunday night with your mm best friend or your mm. your your partner under you know uh, tucked in and it's a it's a it's a it's a poetic yeah it's an art film it's not a, it's not a documentary it's, it's not an doc- art film it's art film yeah. right right um, you you will hear things like the beauty of inner parts or statement i talk to my parts in my head watchmaking is hard Watchmaking is bottomless pit. Again, I talk to my parts in my head, I argue with them. And he who looks learns. Real people. Mm. One thing that really upsets me a lot is big brands uh, hijacking watchmaking aspect uh, when they promote their watches. For example, George Clooney Mm. wearing an eyeglass, having a watchmaker's coat, and he looks like a watchmaker. Why is that necessary? Because real watchmaker does not look like George Clooney, mm. and does not look like Speaking Leonardo himself. DiCaprio, <laughs> mm. it doesn't look like uh, Nicole Kidman. Mm. Real watchmaker, watch the Parmigiani art of watchmaking, and you will mm. see how the real watchmaker and real machinist look like. They don't get credit, unfortunately. My favorite part in that video is actually when one of the older dudes, he's talking about mm. Um, the, the question is like, when's the last time you crashed a machine? Mm. When's the last time you broke something? And he's like, no, 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 I've never broken something. And he pauses. Well, actually, uh, I, I do remember the last time. Mm. It rings like a bell in your head. It was beautiful and, part. <laughs> it was a beautiful part. And you can see him, he's like almost lustfully thinking about it. And then he gets the part where he crashes the machine and breaks the part. And he's like, it's the saddest moment for him. Because it's true. We cannot mm. spoil this for you. No, we can't. No. Because it's it's so deep mm. that that but watch it for yourself but there's another detail it's, it, it, they talk about watchmakers light mm. what is the watchmakers light it's a season in switzerland from spring to kind of end of september when light is different than in any other month and it's everything is bright and full of light mm. to the point it's too much because then you see all the imperfections. So it's very tough period to, to work on a part when there's everything is, even the smallest imperfection is so obvious. Mm. Uh, crazy deep uh, yeah. uh, video. Definitely, if you're a watchmaker's apprentice, uh, show it to your mom and dad and to your friends and to your relatives and tell them, this is me. That's what I want to be, and this is where I want to, you know, uh, to become one day to call myself a mm. watchmaker. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Well, uh, third video for me, and it's uh, it was released as a single kind of forty minute ish, thirty five minute ish video or documentary um, on the Watches TV. It's three parts in ten minutes each. Um, so don't forget to watch all three. Mm. Um, it's a video on uh, Grubel Forcey and how they sort of set out to make their one particular watch, their Handmade One. And the, the sort of concept of the Handmade One is a company like Grubel Forcey, very similar to Armand Strom in that they use a lot of machines and they're, they're not, you know, um, there's no sort of uh, interruption with being able to say that. Um, they set out, they said, we want to make a watch where every single p- component that can be made by hand on at least a scale of, say, 10 per batch, per year or two years, however long it took them, can be made by hand and will be made by hand. So 
they they set out they said cool we have to buy all these old machines they didn't actually have any machines they needed because all the machines they had were cnc and sort of you know oh, computer so they operated. had some but a yeah. lot of missing links that's yeah. correct so um the machines they bought they had to refurbish because they wanted that watch to be as good as any watch they made on their cnc machinery so it's micron capable and all sort of thing um that that process is kind of described across the video and the different issues they've had um, but I think the, the, the part that I really took away from it and that I would like uh, you as the viewer to understand is that they genuinely struggled in some components of this manufacture um, with things they didn't think they would. Mm -hmm. So a couple of examples, um, when they were setting out in the design stage and sort of planning out how long this was going to take, they sort of set out, you know, we want to have this done by this time. They really expected to have, within the first two or three weeks, have a couple of components down, maybe have something kind of, you know, working so they can get to testing. And it took them a month and a half to make one component. So they didn't realise how many rejected parts they were going to have. They didn't realise how difficult it was going to be to get something that they were happy with and happy to sort of present, I guess. And this is, um, this is something that I would say... Uh, we struggle with as well. You, you make a part and you just ex you have such a high expectation for mm. it that you can't stop until it's perfect. Mm. So there's a lot of screws that uh, become test screws once they you know you get a little bit of a scratch or this isn't right. You know, so that I thought was very interesting. Mm. Um, on top of that, they're having issues with their their raw materials. Which is, I can't say that applies to us more with Timascus. Mm. Timascus is very difficult. Um, but the, the, the key thing, just to reiterate, the key thing that I want kind of you to take away is that these guys are very, very good at their jobs. They're some of the best watchmakers in the world. They have some of the best machinists in the world and they're having almost the exact same problems that we are. And it's not to say that, you know, we are the best in the world or anything like that. It's just to sort of ponder that it's quite funny that at each sort of level of the watchmaking uh, industry, regardless of how good you are, how you know, developed you are as a business, they have the exact same issues. They mm -hmm. set out to do something, it takes them longer than they thought, they break more things than they thought they would. Um, I just thought that was very interesting. It's just a really good insight into how difficult it is because they're literally just telling you this helps was really you, difficult. It helps you stay focused on it does. what you try to achieve. Most definitely, mm -hmm. most definitely. Last uh, video. Well, it's not actually a video, um, but it's an Instagram page. And uh, it's it, oh, you can't do that. Changing, no, 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 changing the format. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But there are videos in there, and so that's why I think it, it fits in. Mm. Um, there's, <laughs> you're so disappointed. I love it. Uh, it's it's uh, the, the the Instagram page is called Watchmaker.kl, and it's a guy called Killian Leshnik, and he lives in the southern part of Germany in the Black Forest. And what he is doing, I think, is different to all of. The videos that we've mm. said so far, except for maybe the Grobel 4C video, uh, where he is making a very small series of watches, uh, and eventually they will be done nearly completely by hand. So his journey is absolutely fascinating. I talk to him as much as I can because he's a genuinely lovely guy as well. But he started off and he built his own CNC machine and he made his own, I guess, uh, time only mm -hmm. watch. Um, based on, or at least loosely based on the 6498 caliber. And uh, he sold those, or he, I guess, moved on from that project. Mm -hmm. And he started a project where he's making a very complicated watch, which he's yet to release, but he's creating or manufacturing all, nearly all of the parts by mm -hmm. hand. And I suspect mm -hmm. by the time you know he finishes the watch, it really will truly be a watch done by hand. Mm -hmm. and, and this is happening... In real, time, in real time, as we speak. Correct. Mm. Uh, June 2020, <laughs> yeah. Killian making his watch. That's right. Mm. And so he's been doing it for two or three years, and he's got all these side projects that he, he makes his own tools and all mm. that sort of stuff. Is he a watchmaker, engineer, machinist? What is so he's a watchmaker. He's he, a watchmaker. He did his watchmaking traineeship and graduated school. But from my perspective, I wouldn't... I, I'm not sure if he's even going to like me saying this, but I wouldn't call him a watchmaker. Mm. I would call him a precision machinist mm -hmm. because he took the approach of 
making a watch by hand to the nth degree, which is really the only degree, mm. and he's making the most precise watch in terms of the raw material and the components and the final product that he can. And my understanding is that he also understands the physics, the theory, the, the, the engineering behind yeah. it much deeper than just somebody who is learning from a book and trying to yeah, copy. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And so, I, well, I'm not. I'm not disappointed. You actually introduced <laughs> Killian. Now I, good choice. So I recommend going through all of his Instagram stuff because it's a capsule. It's a time capsule of, of his progress, mm. and it's something that no one really has ever done in watchmaking. Mm. Uh, we're doing it something similar, but obviously not. But he's a one level. person. He's one person. Well, he's got a friend actually. He's got a friend. Well, <laughs> it's still a <laughs> micro it's a, brand. Yeah, it's a micro mm. brand. Mm. Mm. Well, guys, I hope that uh, you will uh, enjoy uh, our recommendation and watch the videos. But while we're here, uh, before we go and before we let you go, uh, I have to take this opportunity to invite anyone who wants to join us in our project mm -hmm. called Manufactured in Australia. Mm -hmm. and especially if you're a young person, mm -hmm. uh, Maybe you have some mechanical background, maybe you're an engineering student, maybe a knife maker, I don't know, a locksmith. Mm. Uh, it doesn't matter. But if you're a mechanically minded person, I hope that you will uh, consider watchmaking, especially in Australia, and join us because we are looking for young, talented people to join our team. Mm. And Andrew, <laughs> while you're here, mm. you know, it's been almost three full years since you joined us, mm -hmm. okay, very briefly, mm -hmm. 20 seconds, yep. was it worth the trouble? Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course it was. So um, I started purely just because I, I sort of knew how to use a couple of the programs that uh, Nick wanted to use and had already kind of invested in. And that was my, my entry in. And then I've learned uh, most of the other, well, pretty much all of the other skills um, since then. And um, I can only see, sort of in the future, I can only see good things um, in regards to my development, in regards to you know, what we're doing here, in regards to the sort of greater picture of Australian manufacturing. And I'm very, very, genuinely very, very proud and honored to be a part of it. So it's, um, yeah. It's you know, I'm experience. always honest about this. And mm -hmm. even if you leave us tomorrow, which mm -hmm. I hope will never happen, yep. uh, I hope that we will, <laughs> always have something for you, a challenge that you mm. will uh, that will find interesting enough to yep. put your time and effort in it. Most because that's, that's ultimate, because we, we, we struggle to find people like you. Mm -hmm. But even if you leave us tomorrow, for whatever reason, do you think that three years that you spend mm -hmm. learning watchmaking uh, will help you find a job in any industry? I mean, I, I hope it would. Well, I, I could say yes, it would, but for me personally, unfortunately, it's absolutely ruined my life <laughs> because the only way for me to continue is to get a similar job. And the problem that I would unfortunately find You have to go is, to Switzerland. I, it doesn't exist, really. I mean, the, the kind of, you know, me having a sort of a finger in every pie, so to speak, where I can kind of tinker with the design and then I can maybe do a little bit of manufacturing and then I can jump on hand finishing and then I service watches and then this sort of thing. You can't do that. No one does that. Oh. You have a very particular, you get very, very good at a particular job and that's kind of what you're assigned to and you might move within that kind of area of watchmaking, I suppose, like hand finishing. But you don't necessarily get to sort of have a taste of every, mm -hmm. every component um, of, of the manufacturing process from paper to to sort of sales, I guess. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, I kind of ruined my life, unfortunately. <laughs> I have to stay here forever now. The bottom line is this, a watch making is hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No matter where you are, Switzerland, Germany, Japan, it's even more, much harder in Australia. Mm -hmm. And again, I always say this, I do thank all our supporters who understand this, who are sophisticated enough to understand that by dealing with us, supporting us, you're supporting a, a completely mm -hmm. new industry, young industry in mm -hmm. Australia, mm -hmm. and you help us grow. We do all sorts of things. We, we design and assemble watches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's our Mark I and Titanium. Mm -hmm. We also make watches. That's uh, the Timascus. Timascus yeah, project where mm -hmm. we manufacture internal watch components here in Sydney, in mm -hmm. Brookville. Mm -hmm. We also buy and sell second-hand high-grade watches. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? We, you said we repair watches. That's correct, yeah. Uh, you put out a daily newsletter. 
we we information. we send mm -hmm. out newsletter to eleven and a half thousand subscribers. We do we do crazy mm -hmm. things like we, mm -hmm. we sell shirts, yeah, <laughs> mugs, <laughs> mugs, book, book review every now and again. Yes. So, I see no reason why you shouldn't support well, us, and if you like to support us, please do so. We appreciate it, and uh, we thank you very much, sincerely. Bye. And next video, uh, you have to subscribe if you haven't. Mm. Next video is about a very important development. It's about ah, yes. gear hobbing. Mm. And uh, make sure you watch the next video. You'll love it. Okay. Thanks.